Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Opportunity. I'm back from vacation, beard a little bit longer, need to go get it trimmed. But that's neither here nor there. Today, I am talking to David C. Barnett. He is a recovering business broker who has a pretty interesting story of how he got into being a business broker and the reason why he got out. We both kind of commiserate on that together with our two experiences. But he was more brokering uh, local businesses versus, of course, we do digital businesses. And now he acts as a consultant, helping people buy SMBs in general. I found David, as you do, just uh, <laughs> having terrible insomnia going on YouTube. And I found him and I thought he was a breath of fresh air because most people do talk about buying businesses online. They're always talking about these zero money down deals, these insane financing stuff, which can work as David and I will get into, but usually it's not what is cracked up to be. And there's a lot of like landmines that might explode if you're not careful. So I really like David's approach to buying a business. It's very pragmatic, very realistic. He's a really cool dude. So if you are interested in buying a local business or just learning some wisdom of buying businesses in general for someone who has helped many, many people do this in his own local market. David is a super cool dude, and I highly recommend you go check out his YouTube channel. All right, with that said, let's get into, we'll switch it right on over. I'll see you on the other side. Bye. All right, I got David here. I will have introduced you a little bit before in my intro segment, but David, I'm really excited for you to be here. This has been in the making for a little bit. So Tell my audience who you are and where in the world you are. Yeah, sure. So my name is David C. Barnett, and I always throw the C in there because there was this Netflix series about a serial killer that has the same name as me, and I want to make sure that people know that I'm not that guy. I live on the East Coast of Canada, and I'm a former business broker. And right now, what I do is I work with buyers and sellers all over the world who are trying to buy or sell small and medium-sized businesses. And I consult and coach them through the process and it basically helping to make sure that they don't do a bad deal. Just on a side note, you should totally hijack that serial killer's search volume on Google, like write a, a blog post. Is David C. Barnett actually David Barnett? <laughs> I, when that series that came out... Again. He, when that series came out, he totally bumped me from the top of Google search, but now I've got him squished back <laughs> down to page two or three. So it's, I'm working on it. Oh, that's funny, man. So before we get into some of the advice from your past as business program, what you're doing now, and first of all, like I think it's cool having this conversation with another person who is, is experienced in the M&A stuff with SMBs. I think that there will probably be quite a lot back and forth with, from us that would be helpful to the audience. But tell me a little bit about the story of David. So you were a business broker. Walk us through that, why you stopped being a business broker that eventually led you to what you're doing today. Sure. So to take you back even further than that, I've just, I was the kid that was always interested in business. So back in the eighties, that family ties show was on TV with a character, Alex P Keaton. If you remember that guy on TV mm. played by Michael J Fox. And I just thought that was the coolest guy on TV. Like he was all interested in business and stuff. And I was interested in business too. And I had all of those sort of teenage businesses that you might have, you know, delivering flyers, shoveling snow, mowing lawns, all that kind of stuff. I wanted to do that. And I would always get frustrated going into businesses when I would see things that were inefficient because I would be like, hey, I'm 15 and I can I know that there's a better way to do that, that you could serve more people more quickly. And I would get frustrated with that. So I was drawn to business. I went to business school because I thought that they were going to help turn me into a businessman. And it was only about three years in when I realized that what they'd actually do there is I now call it, they create Fortune 500 bureaucrats. So people that are <laughs> sort of these middle management types in big companies is what they turn out there. I did finish up there, but when I left, that's when I got the best opportunity to learn about business. I became a sales rep for the Yellow Pages. And so I would go in and sit down and talk with the owners and managers of small and medium-sized businesses, learn how they made money find out what kind of customers they wanted, and then help tailor their yellow page ads to try to draw those types of customers. And so I got to learn a lot about a different, all these different kinds of businesses. Now, this was the early 2000s by this point in my life. And so I realized this thing called Google was probably going to be changing everything. And I, I knew that the days of the yellow pages being so important were, were likely numbered. 
And so I decided I was going to get back into dipping my toe into entrepreneurship. So I tried to buy a franchise and they turned me down saying my market was too small for their franchise. And so I did what any good entrepreneur would do is I studied everything I could learn about them and then copied their business idea. <laughs> and so I basically started the business looking and feeling like their franchise, but without being the franchise, I saved a lot of money that way. And it grew pretty quickly to the point where there were four of us on the team. And I eventually sold that business about a year and a half into it. And I really missed my business owners because in that business, I was doing home services and I was dealing with homeowners. And I wanted to get back into something where I would be doing business with business owners again. So I, I've actually found an opportunity that was advertised to become a broker of business financing. And so I did that and I learned that trade and I started this small business debt brokerage business. So I was helping people to get loans, leases, lines of credit, factoring facilities, which is the sale of accounts receivable and working with these business owners. And I would keep meeting these people that wanted to buy an existing business and they were looking for money to buy the business with. And I didn't know anything about business brokerage at that time. But what I did know was that what I was seeing was definitely not right. So there were people that were getting involved in deals with these deal makers who were clearly amateurs, who didn't know a lot about business. People like real estate agents and, and things like this that were trying to put these deals together. And I saw some people lose deposits. I saw people get into businesses worth no understanding of operating capital, and they would buy a business as an asset sale with no operating capital, then get stuck because they didn't know that they needed money, you know, because the customers were paying in 45 days or something like that. And, and what happened then was we got to that big financial crisis of 2008, 2009. And a lot of the sources of capital that I was using as a finance broker dried up. And I thought, I need to make a pivot because I'm not earning any money. A lot of these companies that I'm getting money from are going under with this asset-backed commercial paper. That was the big headline thing that was going south at that time. And so I thought, what about these people trying to buy businesses? I know that there's got to be a better way to serve these people. And so I went looking for an opportunity and I, I ran across some of these big international franchise business brokerages. And I decided to join up with one and it opened the door to proper training and development. So I started working under the wing of an existing business broker who had been in it for a few years. And I went through the training programs. And after two and a half years, I became certified as someone who can help people buy and sell businesses. And around that time, I became the owner of the local office. So I, I joined as a broker, was with them for a little over a year, year and a half. Then I bought the office and I ran the office for three years. And in, in that time, I helped other people buy and sell 35 other companies. And it was very exciting. And I had year over year revenue and profit growth. And you know, I know you're going to ask me why I don't do it anymore. And I'll tell you the reason, it'll be a bit of a spoiler, is because while business brokerage is super interesting work, like you have to figure out what does the buyer want? What does the seller want? How can the business at hand, given its cash flow, meet the needs of the buyer and have it work out that a purchase price is going to be able to buy that business and meet the needs of the seller? How do you fit this whole puzzle together? And then fit the puzzle together in such a way that both parties, attorneys and accountants and all the other advisors are going to bless this thing and that it's going to go through to closing day and the deal is going to happen. So I love puzzles. I love challenges. And so I was really well suited to it, which is why I did so many deals. At the same time, Greg, it's a terrible business. And, and here's why. It's based loosely upon real estate with the idea that business owners list their business for sale and maybe there's a little upfront fee to get you, get it listed, do the evaluation, prepare the documentation, that kind of thing. But the bulk of the revenue comes when the business is sold from the closing table, some kind of percentage commission. And sometimes you work for years on deals before you're able to close it. The very first listing I got was a fried chicken franchise. And three years later, the last business I sold before I left the industry was that fried chicken franchise. <laughs> and over the three and a half-ish years that I was a broker, I sold that business three times. 
the wow. first two times it fell apart at the 11th hour. And so I did the work three times before it actually closed, completed, and everything worked out and I got paid. And I remember the seller of the business when he wrote me that five-figure commission check said, wow, look at you. Look how much money you earned today. And I said, listen, his name was Tony. I said, Tony, the person that works for you at the front counter has earned more money since meeting you than I have since meeting you, basically, in the last three and a half years, right? And so... So that's the reality of being a business broker. It's this crazy cash flow roller coaster. And even though I sold, you know, more than 35 companies in the three year period, each year had a period of seven to nine months with no deal closings. So, you know, money would come in, go into my bank account, and I would be afraid to spend it. And by the time the money was gone, then I would embark on digging a hole into the red where I would get into my lines of credit and credit cards, then I would close a deal that would just get me back up to zero, right? So right. You, can, you can imagine how difficult it would be to create any kind of family budget, you know, living in that kind of scenario. And so I often joke that all the gray hair on the side of my head and in my beard comes from that period of my life. Because there was, in fact, one time where my assistant, the receptionist and assistant, she was the only salaried employee in the business. Me and the other brokers were all working on commission splits. There was this one time I had to go take my personal credit card, take a cash advance at the bank, and then take the money from that bank, drive over to where my business bank account was, deposit the cash so her paycheck would clear. And, wow. and that's the kind of stress that you get into when you're talking about a business that has this, I call it a lumpy cash flow. And there's no predicting when the deals will close. The buyer usually has a job or another business, right? They have some form of income and they're buying this business to grow in some way, to level up, I, I like to call it. The seller, if it's a profitable business, they own that profitable business. If the closing day is delayed, they just own it longer. So they make more money with it. The lawyers, the accountants often have other clients that are paying them all the time. So if, if a deal is delayed, for some period of time, it doesn't really affect them a whole lot. Yeah, they get anchors are all in salary anyhow. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. And so the only person who really suffers when one of these things just doesn't close or gets delayed is the broker. And so I would have deals. It was pretty normal to have a deal with a closing date that would get bumped along three or four times as different delays were caused by who knows who, like the banker or some inspection or something to do with zoning would come up or some other kind of permit thing would come up or everything was fine. And then someone would realize, well, we need to get this license transferred. And then you go to this government department and the guy who does that's on vacation for two weeks. So now the entire process has to wait until that person comes back. And these are the things that, you know, when you're buying a business, they may happen to you but you're going to get over it and then that'll be behind you. And it's part of the story of when you bought the business, there was this delay because a guy in the government was on vacation. But when it's your business and this is what you deal with all the time and you soon begin to realize that there is a pattern of all of these deals getting interrupted. I like, you know, I refer, use the term, someone spills your apple cart, you know, and you're trying to navigate through a minefield with this apple cart on a wheelbarrow and there's all these different players that each have their own motivations or they're each trying to do something that they feel is their job. You know, lawyers, accountants, bankers, all these people have their own series of reasons why they're doing what they're doing, but they will all be focused on what they need to do. And any number of those different players could set into motion a series of events that causes your apple cart to get upset. And so I left business brokerage because I had two young kids it was really difficult for me to be able to make a plan financially. And so I became a banker and was happy doing that for a while, for almost four years, in fact. But while I was a banker, my phone kept ringing and it was these people that were trying to do these deals and they were given my name by other people that had worked with me before. And they would call me up and say, I'm trying to do this, Dave, can you help me? And so I would say, you know, I'm, I'm not a broker anymore. I don't do that. I work for the bank now. Eventually, this guy called me and, and he said, I'm trying to make this decision. It's like a three quarters of a million dollar investment. I just really need somebody to look at certain things with me and help make sure I'm not making a mistake. And his name was Bob. And I said, Bob, I've got this full time job. I'm working for the bank. I could help you, but it would have to be on the weekend. And I'm not a broker or anything. So I'd have to maybe charge you a consulting fee. And he just said, great. Where do you live? I'll be at your house Saturday at nine. 
And <laughs> so he came over to my house and we sat down at the kitchen table and went through this file. And I very quickly found a few things that were red flags to me that he needed to investigate further. And when he started to go down those rabbit holes, whole other areas of information were revealed that showed that it wasn't the deal he thought it was. And he backed out of it. And he called me up and he said, you know, I spent like $200 with you and you just helped me save three quarters of a million. I don't know how much more I could thank you. Like, this is such a great thing. Eventually, the bank reorganized and they were offering packages to lighten the load of employees. And I thought, hmm, maybe I could turn this into a business. And so part of that package was a continuance. So they basically gave me so many months to find a new job while they continued my salary and benefits. Instead of looking for a new job, I put my efforts full force into building this consulting business. And I thought, what are the things I'm going to need in order to meet with clients, to demonstrate what I do, what processes do I have to put into place? So I started to build this whole apparatus. One of the elements was to start a YouTube channel. And the other element was to write some books about these particular topics. And so I, I threw myself into those tasks. And, you know, within a year, I was doing enough business to get along, you know, to have a paycheck. And that was, that was over seven years ago. And so this has been my full-time gig now for quite some time. That's awesome. That, that's an incredible story for our audience. I found you on YouTube and I think I, I think I sent you a message over on LinkedIn, like, David, I love your style, depressing everyone not to buy a business. Because <laughs> like, you know, but most of the other YouTubers are like, I bought this laundromat for $1 or whatever. You're like, well, that's really dumb of you to do. <laughs> Which I always, I like that personality, that pragmatism, you know. And I will say, so from my experience uh, at Empire Flippers, which, you know, we're a broker of digital businesses, I 100% get that lumpy cash flow. There's so many times in our growth where it's just like we're in the moon, like we're higher than crypto will ever be. And then we're underneath the dirt along with crypto. Like, oh my God, I didn't think we'd end up down here together. <laughs> so I feel you on the lumpy cash flow bit. I often joke with my friends because I'm sure you got this when you were a business broker. A lot of people think like, oh, this is so easy. You just sent out an email to your list. Did you sell the business being a business broker so easy? Like that guy who said like, oh, look, all this money I'm paying you, right? But if you look back at it, if you peel into the actual mechanics of the business, it's really hard. I have a friend, he started a business broker to compete with us, to with digital businesses. I was like, well, good luck, man. I mean, most people I see, they give up within about a month when the reality kind of settles in. He didn't even make it a week before he sold the domain. <laughs> so like, wow. So I, 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 yeah, he was like, ah, oh, this is like much different than I expected. Like, yeah, man, it's not an easy business. <laughs> so let, well, let's get you into know, Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, like, if you think about who a good business broker is, they're a person with a background in sales and finance and business. So that person, if they were going to be out in the wild looking for a job, is probably going to be able to get a six-figure job at least somewhere, right? And so then if you look at the average size of a business and how many files a broker can reasonably manage at any given time, and how many of those files will convert and sell within a year, what you end up realizing is that for that person to earn that six-figure income off of maybe three to five closings a year, then you've got to be charging these you know, commission rates of like 10% or 12% or something. And what will often happen is people will come out of a world like real estate and they'll say, well, we only charge 5% in real estate. I'm going to right. do that. And <laughs> they may even succeed in getting some deals done, but then they'll starve because they're not bringing in enough money to earn that salary and then cover the overheads, you know, like paying for advertising, paying for all the marketing that you have to bring awareness to the business. And it is a challenging business. It's certainly not easy. I field a lot of calls from people that want to get into it. And I give them a few warnings and heads up about <laughs> what they need to do personally to make sure that they give themselves the runway to survive. I mean, you talk about crypto and high tech businesses, they often describe the runway of cash that they have. And I tell people, if you're going to get into business brokers, you need to have some kind of realistic runway because by the time you find, sign up, prepare, and then advertise your listings and then spend the time it takes to find a buyer and then bring that buyer through their side of the process, you know, all the things that they have to do, you need to be able to support yourself for maybe two years comfortably before you can have any hope of a realistic regular cash flow from the industry. 
Yeah. It sounds like we agree on this. And I feel like this is something you and I could talk about a lot and would open up the eyes to many people in my audience. But let's pivot into something that will help out the audience in terms of buying these businesses. Because like I mentioned, one of the things I really liked about you is you keep things just real. You talk about the no money down offers, the creative financing, how a lot of times these are traps that will put you in a really bad position, which I want to get into here in a little bit. But first, before we do that, describe some aspects of buying a business that does pay like that takes people by surprise. I'm sure I can add some of my own, but from your experience, like what are things that like just kind of punches the buyer in the stomach? They didn't realize it was coming. Well, you know, I find that people are always surprised. There's always stuff about a business that you never even think to ask about or that, you know, the seller articulated in a way that didn't completely transmit the reality of the scenario. And it can be about a whole bunch of different things. And people's background is going to color the way that they do their due diligence when they're looking at a business. I recently had a client who I was speaking with who bought a business and his entire focus and due diligence was on the sales and the cost of goods sold. It was like a construction related business. And they had a fleet of vehicles, you know, a bunch of vans and pickup trucks and stuff like that. And he looked at the vehicles and he went online to see what they were going for, like on Craigslist or Kelly Blue Book. And he kind mm. of looked at their value, but he didn't think to take each one of them to like a mechanic and have it looked at. And what ended up happening after the deal was done was it then became apparent that the seller had been deferring maintenance on these vehicles because he knew he was going to be selling the business. And so employees were complaining about noises and shifting that didn't work well or this noise that the transmission made or something. And he was just kind of putting <laughs> these things off. And it turns out that several of the vehicles needed several thousand dollars worth of repair work. And if he had known better, it would have been a negotiating point or he would have told the guy like, you know, you say those three trucks are worth 10 grand each, you keep them. I'll take a $30,000 discount. You sell them. I'll go buy three more used trucks kind of thing. And so there's always something that people are not aware of. How does a buyer protect themselves from that? Because in my experience, we have similar issues. Like obviously we're not selling trucks, but like with an e-commerce business, buyers will sometimes just look at the cash flow and aggregate without ever really dissecting profit by product. And you might have a product that's been declining forever. It's going to become dead weight, if not already dead weight, that's just adding up inventory fees. You know, things like that could hit you in the digital space. So what can a buyer do to be more self-aware of these kind of issues? Well, it comes down to what do you know about the business you're getting into? One of the questions that I will often ask people, you know, say somebody finds a roofing business for sale is I will say, why has no other roofer come and bought this? <laughs> That's a question you should ask, right? And oftentimes in a city, if you have like, you know, if think of a small city and there's like a dozen roofers, one of the roofers in the city probably doesn't want to buy it because he just figures that if you close down, they'll get extra business anyway. But the real value for that roofing company is to the roofer in the next county over because that person can now grow geographically by doing an acquisition. And so if the business is well run and the business is making good money and the business has the systems and processes in place that allow employees to be empowered, that you can easily run this business. These are all the sort of the key things that people say they look for when they want to buy a business. Then that business in the next county that's in the same line of work should want to buy them. Right. And so if there's nobody like that, then it leads me to wonder what part of that story is actually untrue or is it just way overpriced or is there something else about this business that we don't know about? And if I'm dealing with a buyer who's never been involved in that industry before, then I'll say to them, like, what is every other roofer seeing that you're missing? And so sometimes it's not just a matter of getting help to look at the deal, but it also requires you to be committed to learning about an industry. When people come to me and they say, I want to buy a business, I'll say, great, let's figure out what kind of business you want to buy. And people like to use terms like industry agnostic to say, I'll look at anything. Right. The problem with that is that you now have a new learning curve every time you look at a different kind of business. Whereas if you say, I'd like to own a roofing business, 
You can then find the Roofing Business YouTube channel. You can buy books about how to run your roofing business. You can call the suppliers. You can find out that they're doing a training event for the new product that they have coming out. And they'd love for you to come and look at it because they want you to become a customer one day. And you can like dive into the industry and you can learn about this stuff. You then start networking and you find the guy who retired five years ago from the industry, used to be a business owner. You invite him out to lunch. You start talking to that person. You really build your industry knowledge. Then when you get this business that's for sale, you might get help from a guy like me helping you with the transaction. But then you can go back to that retired roofer and get his opinion on the deal and say, what's going on in this business that would make me not want to buy it? What is the problem that you see? And so it's that specific industry knowledge that's often missing with a lot of buyers because they will get this impression that sort of business is business and businesses maybe are, you know, easy to run or something like this. You know, you're involved in the world of online businesses. And one of the biggest misconceptions I've run into with respect to people in online business is they'll equate online business with automatic business. <laughs> they'll think that once well, they own automated. it, they just, start, <laughs> they, they just start to get this stream of money where I know people that own online businesses that work full work weeks, right? They're right. fiddling with SEO. They're putting content up. They're changing the way things are worded. I know a guy who's an Amazon FBA. He runs a real warehouse. He has containers coming from China. He's sending them to different Amazon warehouses. Like he's got employees. He owns a forklift. Like it's a real business, even though it falls into this category of online business. And so misconceptions about an industry are a big issue for buyers. And I will often say to people, you want to have experience or knowledge in an industry or at least an analogous industry. Like if you come out of roofing and you want to buy a fence company, I'll say, yeah, okay. Like it's project oriented, you're servicing homeowners. Like there's a lot of parallels there that, that, you know, would translate, but you want to have something that you can bring to the table because the biggest value that you can find in buying a business is to find a business that makes money and has problems that you know how to address. That's the best opportunity. Because you can get into that business because it's already profitable. You've got this unending runway and then you can start to work on those problems and you can fix them and create something of greater value. That's when you end up with a good deal. Yeah, I, I agree. With the knowing the industry, I think is super important. In our world, I always say know the business model because like an affiliate site that is about you know dogs versus one about cats or one about even like health supplements. While the industry is different, the business model is more or less the same and you can kind of like adapt from that. With buying an offline business, I feel like knowing the industry is probably even more important. But understanding like just the mechanics of how this thing works, like you said, a lot of people, especially with online businesses, they see all the gurus on YouTube, like I automated my faceless YouTube channel or whatever the trend of the day is. But I've sold over 2000 businesses and even the most automated business that we've sold, like the most hands off still is hands on. (laughs) Like there's no real hands off business. So uh, that bleeds into my next question. So why do you think it is that people underestimate the realities about running a business? Like why is this so common where they think like this system will take care of everything for them? Well, I think there's a big difference between someone who's an experienced business person, whether they've been an owner or not, you know, I'll tell you the people that work with me as buyers fall into two pretty distinct camps. So the one camp is the middle-aged person who's had a career and they are ready to move into their own thing. They want to level up through buying a business. They've run a department They've been a manager in a business. They've dealt with human resource issues. They've managed a P&L for a bigger entity. They know how a business functions, but they're middle-aged or approaching middle age. They've got a home mortgage. They've got a couple of kids that are headed towards college. They have all of these family responsibilities. So they say, you know, I can't quit and do a startup. It's too risky. So eventually they will stumble upon the idea of buying an existing profitable business. So that's one group. And those people tend to be very aware of what they're getting into and they know what they're getting into. The other group of people that I work with are people who have some kind of barrier to employment. Maybe they're new to the country and they're 
professional credentials aren't recognized in their new home. So they're an engineer in Vietnam, but when they come to you know North America, all of a sudden they can't be an engineer anymore. And so they need to get an income. So they're going to buy a business that will provide for them and their family. The people that I find ask sort of the most interesting questions on my YouTube channel are the people who are in neither camp. These are people who are, they come online and they have some kind of other problem, Greg. They're like, I want money. I want to be rich. And then somehow <laughs> they stumble across the idea that buying a business is somehow a magical pill solution to this wish about being rich, right? Because when they come at me, they come at me with questions about reasonable return on investment and what kind of return on equity should I be looking for? And they want to take every small business and put it into a spreadsheet like you might analyze the stock of a telephone company. Right. Yeah. And they've got probably an MBA behind them. And but they're taking this world of big business analysis type of metric stuff, this quant stuff, and they're trying to apply it to a small business. And they're asking me about rates of return and if this, you know, candidate business meets all these hurdles. And I'll say, well, have you ever worked in that industry? Do you know how to run that kind of business? I'll try to bring them back down to the reality because the reality is that people own these businesses because of one of a few other factors. They own them because they don't want to work for somebody else or they can't work for somebody else or nobody will hire them or they are truly a creative entrepreneur that decides to get into being an entrepreneur, right? Most of the people that I work with, they end up buying a business because they want more liberty and freedom in their life. Very few people that I meet get into business because they just want money. In fact, of that first big camp of people that I talked about, those sort of middle-aged people that are looking to get out on their own, a huge number of them knowingly take a huge income cut when they get into their own business. So I'll work with people that are C-suite executives that want to buy a fly fishing launch because they want to leave the big metro. They want to get out of the rat race and they want to have a more peaceful, idyllic existence in the countryside where they can be more in touch with things that they enjoy and spend more time with their family. And they know that they're going to earn less money, but they want to make that trade off because they've come to realize that that's not what they want. They want liberty and freedom over probably just the cash. I mean, some of these people earn half a million dollars and they're willing to trade it for a better existence and a lower income. And so a lot of the times when I meet those people who sort of are chasing money, I'll say, look, Buying a business is not a pill or a solution to your money problems. It's not a Hail Mary maneuver. It's a leveling up maneuver. And the last thing you want to do is take every last penny that you have and put it into a deal or borrow a bunch of money that you can't afford to lose and put it into a deal, hoping that this business, the way it's been represented to you, works out just perfectly and you're going to end up you know, making all this money and buying the Lamborghini or something. You need to know what you're doing, but there is no other asset class as risky as small or medium-sized businesses. If a small business has been successful, it will have a large degree of goodwill associated with its price. And here's the definition of goodwill. It's simply the difference between the purchase price of a business and the value of the tangible assets within. So if the pizzeria generates a hundred grand of cash flow and you're willing to pay 250 grand for the pizzeria, and there's you know, $75,000 worth of equipment and furnishings in that pizzeria, then guess what? You've just paid $175,000 of goodwill. This is the difference between your $250,000 purchase price and the $75,000 value of the stuff. If you go into that pizzeria and you change the sauce recipe because you think it's going to be better and all of the regular customers don't like the new sauce and they stop buying your pizza, the goodwill just vanished in a day. <laughs> right. You just wrecked that thing. You just drove it into the ground. I mean, real estate investors can't do that. Stock market investors struggle to do that. I mean, maybe crypto investors can lose all their money in a day, but there's not many other <laughs> they, people. They can lose can all their crash. money in a few moments. <laughs> <laughs> there's not many other assets you can buy that can be wrecked so readily. And so, you know, I'll say to people, like, if you want to get into owning your own business, that's great. If you're young, build your assets, build your savings, build your equity, build your skills, learn about business, learn how to manage a business and come at it from a leveling up position. You're at power level five, buying the business is going to help you get to power level six or whatever, however you want to imagine it. 
But in doing the deal, you can't put yourself into a vulnerable position where you suddenly are fragile. And I know when we were talking earlier, you wanted to ask me about leverage and all this and no money down, all this kind of stuff. The more you borrow to buy a business, the more fragile your footing is going to be because you've made a bigger commitment for monthly cash flow that has to come out of that business. So it, it ends up handcuffing you to a certain degree of what maneuvers you can make in the business. And if you go to business school, they'll tell you there's an optimum amount of leverage and that if you don't have enough debt in your business, you're not getting an adequate return on equity. But when everything goes to crap and the economy sinks down, the leveraged businesses are the ones that fail and the ones that have a lot more equity and are under leverage are the ones that come and buy them at 20 cents on the dollar, right? right. And so uh, oftentimes a privately controlled business is the primary wealth vehicle of its owner. And so people will sometimes, I'll even do this, I'll say this business is under leveraged, but that business fits within a wealth portfolio of that owner. And they may, you know, whether they're sophisticated and they're able to articulate this or not, they're making decisions about what they want to do and how they want to run things. And they may choose not to have as much leverage in their business. And so you buy that thing and then you go and get a, like a 90% SBA loan or something. Now you are running that business with a huge amount of leverage. And if some kind of bump happens in the market and your sales go down, I often remind people that businesses are asymmetrical systems. A 10% reduction in sales could be a 40% reduction in profit, right? And if you've committed half of your free cash flow to debt service and you have a 40% decline in profit, all of a sudden you may struggle to take your own paycheck out. And these are the stories that don't get highlighted online. You know, people who appear online and tell a successful story of business acquisition, it's something called survivorship bias. You know, <laughs> yep, yep. when the planes were coming back from the Battle of Britain in World War II, they looked at the planes that were full of bullet holes and they said, oh, you know, we should be armoring these planes to better protect them from the bullets. And someone said, no, we have to look at where the bullets haven't hit because the other planes got hit in those places and they didn't make it back. We can't analyze the survivors. We need to think about the planes that weren't able to get back, you know? So there's always like these TEDx talks about people who are very successful, who, you know, hit it out of the park kind of thing. But there's a lot of failure in business. Small businesses are risky. And if you're going to get into it, you need to come at it from a position of power. You can't put your last nickel into it. There is nothing is better at solving problems than cash. And so if you're going to buy a business, you always want to have extra cash available in case something goes wrong. One of these unforeseen things. I want to get into the, how much cash you think we should have when we're buying a business and, and a little bit of the deal structure and stuff. But before I do, I've always been personally curious on this. And since your background in business brokering, I feel like I know the answer, but I'm curious on your opinion on it. So those businesses, I usually see them on places like Biz by Sell that are you know, turn-based, turnkey or whatever. Often it's like an ATM route or a laundromat. These things are often marketed like very hands-off, passive. Like I saw one in Texas, I forget which city, but like together, both locations were making like 30K a month. Like in your experience, what's the grift going on here? Because I'm assuming that's not true, right? Like these aren't like truly hands-off or does that really exist? I don't think there's any such thing as a hands-off business except buying the stock of a dividend and paying publicly traded company, like, you know, it has a full <laughs> management team in place or something like that. But, you know, is that two location laundromat a grift? I don't think so. I just think that you need to be the right buyer. So when you see that business, you know, what does the laundromat need? It needs a pair of eyes on it. It needs somebody that can respond to problems. So it's either got to be a big enough business that there's an employee present. So maybe there's a wash and fold service there too. But if there isn't a wash and fold service there, then how are you going to keep an eye on it? Well, it's hard to employ someone casually, part-time, and have them be available on demand to take care of that asset the way you would. So when I see a business like that, I think that's a perfect business for somebody who is in that city, who has complete control over their own time. So someone like a taxi driver or a real estate agent, 
could do well with a business like that because they're mm. running around the town doing their business, showing homes or something. And then if they look in at the security cameras on their phone with these digital systems that they have and they see a problem, they can run right over. They can address the problem. They can be close at hand to manage things. They can empty out the machines once or twice a day. Because a lot of the times you look at these businesses and when you realize that, you know, there's been no expense allowance for employment for a worker, someone to work there. And so it really makes sense as sort of a part-time side hustle kind of thing for somebody who's there locally. But if you were away in another city and you were relying on employees to kind of do everything for you or heaven forbid calling the you know appliance repair guy for every little thing, you wouldn't be making any money. I've sold <laughs> laundromats before and I've known people who have operated laundromats and they all tell me the same thing. The first thing you need to learn is how to do all the most basic repairs on washers and dryers because the maintenance costs will eat you alive if you're calling the professional service company every time. Yeah, I could see that. And that leads me into another question here. So I have friends, they're successful digital entrepreneurs. They build you know, six figure, seven figure e-commerce stores. And now they're looking at buying local businesses. And a lot of them have this idea that if I buy a big enough business with big enough free cash flow, then I can just hire a manager to take care of it and I can run it remotely, which I think there's probably truth to. There's some truth to that, but I feel like there's also probably problems with that that they're not seeing. In your experience, have you had uh, clients who do this? They'll buy a local business and run it remotely where they're not in that town. Yeah, I've had a lot of people do it and I'll tell you the formula that works. So if you think about any kind of chain business, like think about a gas station chain like mobile, right? So mm -hmm. in a given city, there might be a couple dozen mobile stations. Each one has a manager, but mobile doesn't let the manager run the business all year and then report a set of financial statements to head office, right? There is someone called a regional manager whose job it is, is to keep an eye on the local store managers, right? And that regional manager is looking at certain metrics and information from each store to see what's going on in there. So if you're going to own a business remotely and you're going to manage it with a manager in place, you need to develop that regional manager skill set. So here's the problem, because I'll see a business, one I was talking with someone about recently, it was a transmission shop, and it was advertised as absentee owned because the guy who owned it ran it from Florida. but he ran it on site for 30 years before he moved to Florida. And so he knew the business inside and out, and he had someone come up underneath him that became the manager. And now he's in Florida and he's logging in on his computer. He does payroll from Florida. He can check his video cameras from Florida. He can look at the back end of the sales system from Florida, and he can call and talk to his manager whenever he wants. But he knows the business inside and out, and this is how he's able to keep an eye on it using those tools. If I bought it, I don't know the transmission business. And so I, I'm not able to look at the same series of tools and numbers that he is and know what's going on in the business, right? So people who pull this off successfully, what they do is they buy a business, usually from an owner operator, they get into it full time and do a transition period where they learn how to be the owner and manager. They then usually bring a greater sophistication with systems and operating procedures. The new owner now can build those tools and most importantly, some kind of management dashboard. So I knew one guy who does this really well with several businesses that he owned while he kept a job. He would have each of his business managers do a weekly dashboard and the metrics were different for each business depending on what they were. But certain key bits of information that let you know what happened in the business. And once you've been collecting it for long enough, then you can compare to the prior week or the year over year week or whatever you have. And then you can very quickly at a glance, see how the business is performing. So you have to learn the business so that you can create those tools so that you can become the area manager. Now you can observe and manage your manager from afar with only a limited time investment. And here's the other thing is that when that person quits, gets sick, has some other thing happen to them that causes them not to be there anymore, in all likelihood, you're going to have to step back in again. Because one of the key things that is missing for most small businesses is what one of my, I run a group coaching program. There's a guy in there who owns a few businesses. He refers to it as bench depth. And it's a key concept. 
that you can have a business with a manager and then a bunch of line employees, but if the business isn't big enough, you're never going to develop that middle manager, the assistant manager who can truly step in and cover everything the manager is doing. And if you don't have that bench depth, it means that if something happens to the manager, you're back in the business. And so this is one of the issues I have about people who might want to buy a business in another state or another place that's very remote to them. It's got to be big enough to have that bench depth and they have to be able to know what the numbers are that they want to keep an eye on to have that regional manager kind of ability. So there is a nugget of truth in what you said. I just think it needs a lot more clarification. And to say, you know, for you to tell me that you have some online business owner friends looking at those real world businesses, that doesn't surprise me at all. Because again, businesses are often extensions of the owner's personal investing strategy. And I've met a lot of, you know, sort of tech or software entrepreneurs who will come to me for help buying like a liquor store because they right. see it as a diversification of their, yeah. you know, business asset portfolio, right? Something very different that's going to operate in a very different way. Yeah, that makes total sense. I feel like that, like my friends aren't thinking it as thorough, like, they're not thinking it through as much as what you just described there, but I like the regional manager attitude and the bench depth. That's for sure true. Like most of my friends, even the guys running in multiple seven fair e-commerce stores, they barely even have a manager. I would say most of them don't even have that in their own business, much less the business that they're looking to go and buy. Right. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Is there a certain type of business that lends itself better for remote operating than others? Like obviously if you're buying a roofing business, you probably should be local, but like, is there other business models that lend itself better to that? Yeah, I would say that anything that has been developed out as a franchise system obviously has some key characteristics that lends itself to high degrees of systematization. Even if you're buying an independent business, if there are key franchises in that sector, it's usually a good sign that it's a business that can be systematized to a high degree. Yeah, that's a nice call. I, I didn't think about that because franchises are heavily, heavily systemized. Though I guess you'd want to make sure that the franchise is successful because there's a lot of unsuccessful franchises too. But yeah. All right, I, I want to move into the actual deal structuring bit because you do have a bit of a finance background. So at least no money down or very little money down kind of deals. We've already kind of talked about the danger of doing this and like even with something like SBA of over levering yourself. But is there like good reasons, like good opportunities where you could do a no money down offer? Like, does that exist or are you almost always completely against it? So again, when people say no money down, what many people will think you're saying is that you can somehow get a business and borrow all the money to buy the business. And so you don't need any business. And there are no money down deals done all the time where people get 100% leverage, but it's because they're leveraging other assets or things that they have access to. So if there was a business for sale for hundred grand and you had $300,000 of home equity and you went and got a HELOC for hundred grand and bought the business cash, you know, technically you bought the business with no money down, no money down. but you leveraged your house, right? And so people will say, wait a minute, that's not what it means. Right. And so <laughs> this is where, you know, you have to get into the fine details of what people are talking about because people will get out online and they'll say, I bought this business with no money and you can too. And the implication is that they can somehow teach you a way that even if you're broke and you're down on your luck and you've got bad credit, that somehow you can get something valuable, a profitable, established, money producing business even though somehow you're broke, right? And so to me, that means something for nothing. And so you have to question, like, why would the seller want to get into that kind of situation? Because a lot of the times it'll be explained that you have to get a situation where the seller is going to finance this deal for you. And I would agree seller financing is important because it can be subject to offset. And I rarely ever have any client that I say, you know, you should buy this business, even if there's no seller financing. I always want a material degree of seller financing subject to offset in case there's a problem with the business that is only discovered afterwards. Just real quick, but if David, you then you think about what it, subject to offset is. Yeah. So in the seller note, so in the document that describes the debt, 
it'll say, you know, you have to pay a certain amount per month for so many years. Mm -hmm. You could say in there that this note is subject to offset in the case of material misrepresentation or undiscovered or undisclosed liens or liabilities. I see. I see. And so if you bought a factory and you got a forklift with it, and then three months after the sale, the leasing company shows up because they haven't been getting payments on their forklift, but you thought you were, <laughs> you're the owner of the I forklift. Know, right. Yeah. Right. What you can then do is say, well, okay, show me the documentation that you're owed money and then you can pay the leasing company. And then you turn around and you offset the seller note by that amount of money. And you say to the seller, you sold me this forklift and you didn't even own it. There's still this liability attached to it. And so that's an offset. So it protects you. It's kind of like a warranty that the information you were given was true. And so if you say to someone, well, I'm going to buy your business. I want you to finance 100% of it. That would literally mean someone's going to take the keys to a profitable business and hand them to you, hoping that you run the business correctly and maintain its profitability and pay them over time. So think about it from the seller's point of view. Why on earth would anyone do that? Right? right. So I would want to understand what are the motivations. Now, you know, if the seller's your dad or something like that, obviously there's scenarios like this, but there is actually a book out there that is a heavily marketed book that talks about how you can buy a business with no money where a guy, the author describes how he bought this very successful business with no money, but he never once gets into a discussion that at the time he also owned a successful business. And so when I read the book, what I was reading is, oh, he leveraged the equity in his existing business to help him buy this new business as a 100% leveraged acquisition because a bank will look at both entities combined. And so if you have a sufficient equity position in the first company, you can leverage that into making the acquisition for the next company. If somebody was reading this book and didn't have any kind of background in finance or business or M&A, and they just read, oh, this guy knows how to buy businesses with nothing down. Let me go sign up for his $10,000 course. <laughs> like this person now thinks that there's this secret out there of how to do this. And it's not real. It's the lie is in what's not told, you know, the information that's not shared. And the biggest problem is that a lot of the people who would be susceptible to these informations, they don't know what questions they should be asking. Because a lot of the times they don't have a background or experience in business. Yeah, I I feel like the best weapon a buyer can arm themselves with is purely just understanding what kind of questions are out there to ask. Because like if you don't know the category, you're just not going to know. Like subject offset, like I know of that term, but not by that name. <laughs> so like you described it like, oh, okay, that makes sense. It's very similar to like the earnout scenarios we do with e-commerce stores, right? But if you don't know that, like you just simply don't know, you're walking into a potential landmine. Have you ever looked at buying businesses, like financing it, like the business's own asset? So for example, with the forklift, like could a buyer finance part of the deal using that seller's forklift mm -hmm. as part of the deal? Like how does a yeah. situation like that work? So that's done all the time. And so the typical formula for buying a business is that you have some money of your own, the, your equity, so your down payment, and then you might borrow from a bank against any assets that might be serving as collateral. And then the seller will finance part of it as well. That's the typical formula. And for people that are listening that are in the States, you would refer to that as a conventionally financed acquisition. And it's different from an SBA loan because in an SBA situation, they look at the whole business as one big asset. And then it's because of the government guarantee program that they'll lend against it as one big asset. But let's look at the example of this conventional financing. Yeah, you're going to have equipment in the business, but the bank isn't going to lend you 100% of the value of the equipment, right? Because the bank looks at the problem of if we have to ever seize this collateral and then sell it. Number one, we're going to be in some kind of forced liquidation scenario, and it's going to be at some point in the future where things are going to be worth less. So a bank will typically want assets to be appraised, and they might lend a percentage of that value. And the bank, you know, they've been through this before. They understand that business is a risky asset. They've seen businesses fail. And so they protect themselves through making sure that you have a reason to succeed. And that reason to succeed is your own equity involvement. And so the way it's expressed on a balance sheet, when you buy a business, you're going to have an opening balance sheet. Well, my balance sheet looks like the day I buy. They typically want to see a certain debt to equity ratio. 
the ratio of how much money of your own money is in it versus how much is borrowed. They aren't going to care who you're borrowing it from, right? Whether it's borrowed from the seller or borrowed from the bank, it's still debt. It's going to have a cash flow drain on the business. Sometimes they're willing to play little tricks. Like if the seller agrees to not take any payments for a certain period of time, they'll allow you to stretch these rules a little bit, but they want to see that you have some kind of money put into the deal that you have a reason to fight and make this thing work. If you try to buy a business with no equity, then the bank is going to be like, hmm, if something goes wrong, you're just going to bail. So <laughs> why would we invest? Right. And so yeah. I will sometimes have people that, you know, people go online and they follow these gurus and they really want to believe, Greg, they want to believe so much that they can do this. Right. And they'll say, well, I won't use a bank. I'll use an alternative lender. Great. So you want to use some kind of alternative lender, an asset-based lender for the assets. Well, the bank might agree to lend you 75% of fair market value of that equipment. A hard money lender or an asset-based lender, they might agree to lend you 75% of orderly liquidation value. Okay. So now we've changed the definition of what the value is. is. <laughs> and so now what's happened is even though it, on the surface is still 75%, we're 75% of a different number. And so now the amount of the loan shrinks tremendously while the cost of the loan goes way up, right? And so I've seen people successfully manage to band-aid together a deal on a really small business using every kind of string they can pull between credit cards and leasing stuff and selling stuff to leasing companies and leasing it back and then doing a merchant cash advance and all this kind of stuff. And they'll patchwork together this deal to make the deal close. And they'll say, look, I bought a business with no money. And then on day two, they realize that they've so committed the cash flow that they now have to work for free for the next three years. I call it the day two problem is they never think about what will it be like to operate under these conditions with these kinds of obligations in place. And you know, regular bank loans now are up to 10% interest. So the world of the secondary alternative lenders, you know, they're way more expensive than that. What ends up happening is you end up working Monday to Friday all these hours for finance companies. You know, that's yeah. not why people get into business. People get into business for freedom. That, uh, so what you brought up there, so there was something that happened in our industry a little bit this year, but mostly the fall happened last year. There was all these people called the aggregators that raised literally hundreds of millions of dollars by Amazon FBA businesses. And I feel like they basically did the big M&A version of what you're describing. <laughs> they were just raising so much debt and equity and buying all these businesses. But the issue was none of them had ever ran an e-commerce business before. Like they're all incredibly intelligent people, like very intelligent MBA graduates, usually from Harvard or Wharton Business School, right? They're like, they understand a spreadsheet very well, but they don't understand an e-commerce store very well. <laughs> so they ended up all kind of like collapsing in on each other to the point now, like they are so straddled with debt and just a myriad of financial issues. Like I have a friend, I won't mention their names, but anyone who follows the industry would know these guys were huge, like probably one of the biggest names in the space. And all the founders got kicked out by their own corporation, their own corporate board that took over the wow. business from them, right? Because of how bad things had gone so upside down. And many of the earnouts that these companies owed were now being paid out with equity. Like, hey, we can't pay you money, but how would you like equity in our failing business? <laughs> uh. All these deals that they had already signed, right? Like, so I've seen that happen. Yeah. Anyways, David, we're coming up on top of the hour, so we're going to wrap this up here, but I feel like we could, you and I could probably just talk forever. So tell well, us. That just means audience. you have to have me come back sometime, Greg. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to have you come back. Yeah. We could both commiserate over the buyers chasing the deal to the psychotic end. <laughs> they lose all their capital just to make it happen. But where can people follow you in the audience? Like, where do you hang out? If someone in our audience want to reach out to you about buying a local business or businesses in general, where can they sure. do that? Yeah. The central nervous system of all the stuff I have online is at davidcbarnett.com. And from there, you'll find blog posts with embedded YouTube videos, and there's links to the YouTube, Twitter, podcast, all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, if you just search almost any platform, David C. Barnett, small business, you'll find me rather quickly. But I do have an email list over at davidcbarnett.com that people can sign up to if they are interested in receiving more information. I send out something every day and it's either 
an announcement of a live stream where I'm going to talk with a guest or it's a story that of something that's happening to someone or a deal that I'm working on that people can learn from. And there's just all that stuff is free. There's over 500 videos on the YouTube channel now. Oh, that's awesome. Man. Yeah, I love your YouTube channel. Like I said, I basically Netflix and binge your stuff when I found it. Like, oh, this guy's great. So I highly recommend everyone in the audience to go check out David. It's really good stuff, very down to earth and realistic, which I think is very needed in this space. So David, thank you so much for coming on, man. It was a pleasure. Man, thank you very much for the invitation. I've had a great time. And thank you very much to all your listeners for tuning in. It's been great. There you have it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it got you inspired at all the different things that are happening in this industry. And of course, if you just want to buy a highly profitable business, you can always go to empireflippers.com slash marketplace, or maybe you want to make an exit of your highly profitable business. Then you could go to empireflippers.com slash sell your site. I've been your host, Greg. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you leave a review. Give us a like, a follow, share it across social media. Talk to you all soon. See you on the next episode.